Welcome to the history and development of vaccines presented through the Glenview Public Library. Uh, the timing of this presentation couldn't be more appropriate given the news uh, in the last several weeks. So I'm very pleased to introduce our guest speaker tonight. Renee Nahara is a doctor of public health and senior epidemiologist at a local health department in Virginia. He's also the editor of the History of Vaccines Project from the College of Physicians of Philadelphia. The History of Vaccines Project aims to document the long history of vaccination and tie it into current events for audiences ranging from laypersons to university academics. Dr. Nahara has worked on outbreaks at the state level in Maryland uh, with foreign governments in South America and with the CDC during the Zika epidemic in Puerto Rico. So I'd like to welcome Dr. Nahara and uh, thank you for joining us. Hand thank you. you. Thank, thank you for having me. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, like Jill said, this could not be more uh, important, right, or pertinent, I think the, the word should be. Um, yes, uh, I'm an epidemiologist. I work at a local health department, the Fairfax County Health Department in Virginia. I also am an associate at the Johns Hopkins University School of Public Health teaching epidemiology. I'm an adjunct at the George Mason University uh, Global Community Global and Community Health Department uh, teaching biostatistics. And then I'm also the editor of the History of Vaccines. I have plenty of time in my life, right? Um, I just wanted to you know, tell you off the top, uh, I have no financial conflicts of interest. I don't hold any holdings in any vaccine manufacturers or pharmaceuticals. Uh, you can have my tax returns if, <laughs> if you really wanna check. Um, and then also uh, any opinions that I have don't represent, no, ne don't necessarily represent those of my employers, right? That are my opinions. Uh, so don't go, you know, uh, run, running to my employers, telling them that I said that vaccines were great. I'm sure the health department would not like to hear that. Uh, so anyways, uh, as Jill said, there's a Q&A. I'm going to keep an eye on the Q&A. Uh, I'm going to keep an eye on the chat, but mostly the Q&A. If you want to, like, somewhere along the way you want to ask me a question, please feel free to do that. Um, I'm plenty used to stopping and, and answering questions. Uh, at the same time, if, if I'm really into a slide, into a section, uh, don't mind me not seeing the q and I'll get to it. I'll, I'll check it over. So um, without further ado, I'm going to start here the, the presentation. And I am going to start the presentation, not just not just talk about it. So I have a slightly different title to it, right? Uh, history of vaccines from antiquity to last week. Uh, uh, history on vaccines is always being made. There's always some research going on. Um, and so I'm gonna start at the very beginning, way back in antiquity and then move us uh, along the way uh, at some leaps in technology and science that happened along the way to take us to where we are today with the mRNA vaccine. So, let me tell you a little story real quick. This is this is Maurice Hilleman. He's a pediatrician or was a pediatrician uh, doctor. Uh, he he was instrumental in creating several of the vaccines that you know of today: chickenpox, hepatitis A, hepatitis B, uh, a whole bunch of other vaccines. But the the vaccine that he really contributed to personally is the mumps vaccine, and that is the vaccine that up until last week had the record for the fastest vaccine of going from conception when somebody. Uh, somebody thought of it to um, to actual manufacture and delivery to the public, which was four years. Um, and and the mRNA vaccine, not necessarily, it, it goes back to the beginning of the century, and I'll talk about that for when it was conceived, but the mRNA vaccine for coronavirus was conceived, or the idea was conceived in January of this year. And here we are, you know, 10, 11 months later with the vaccine already being injected into people. That is super fast, but as I, I'm going to show you, it's because of couple of hundred years of technology, a couple of hundred years of uh, understanding vaccines. So Dr. Hilleman one night got woken up by his daughter, and this is not his daughter, this is just a picture of a child with mumps. Um, Dr. Hilleman's daughter, Gerald, Ger Gerald Lynn, got um, the mumps, and like most kids did back in the 1950s, right? That was one of those rites of passage. Uh, up until I was young, I think, uh, there was also uh, a, a large number of kids who got mumps. Certainly saw it in, in the Brady Bunch, right, when they all got the, the mumps. Um, if you if you go through it, fine. You know you end up getting lifetime immunity, um, no no problem. But unfortunately, about one in a thousand kids develop some sort of complication, and about one in a thousand of those, more or less. I mean, I'm not being precise. I don't have the, the research paper right here with me. But about one in a thousand of one in a thousand, so one in a million, uh, ended up unfortunately passing away from mumps. Uh, it was it, it was deadly to them. So very painful inflammation of the um, the salivary glands right here. That's this is why this child has 
kind of that uh, goiter looking, you know, pelican looking uh, situation going on there, uh, high fevers and, and, and other things. And so uh, in some children and, and those complications included becoming uh, infertile uh, because the high fever would essentially uh, in, in women part in particular, because women are born with all of their ovaries. So when they had a, a very high fever and the virus also attacked their, uh, their ovaries, they would end up being infertile. So it was, that was one of the harshest complications short of death. Right. So, um, Dr. Hilleman was woken up by Gerald Lynn in the middle of the night and Gerald Lynn had had mumps and he had been working on a technique of getting the, the virus and putting it on a Petri dish and growing it over and over again until it became attenuated, but doing it very fast. It, it wasn't, uh, it used to be, and I'll talk about it when I talk about how they did it for rabies. It used to be that you had to use an animal to attenuate the virus and get it to be uh, non, non-lethal, non-harmful. That's what we mean by attenuated. It's still alive, still multiplies. It still gives an infection, but it doesn't give disease. And so uh, he he had the idea of, hey, I'm going to swab Gerald in and I'm going to take that back to the lab in the middle of the night and I'm going to start growing it. And that is the Gerald Lynn strain. Gerald Lynn is a little girl here on the left um, who had mumps. And this this other physician, this other uh, uh, doctor is giving Gerald Lynn's younger sister the mumps vaccine with the Gerald Lynn strain to this day. Uh, we still use the Gerald Lynn strain for mumps. And so this is now 50, 60, almost 70 years ago that this was that this happened and it was done in record time at the time of four years to go from getting the, the swab out of Gerald Lynn's throat to getting the vaccine into uh, Gerald Lynn's uh, younger sister, right? So this is a little bit of history of what, what goes on in developing the vaccine. Somebody has to dream it and then somebody has to put it to work and it takes a while uh, and here we are 200 years after the first vaccine, uh, you know, dealing with the mRNA vaccine. So let me step back real quick and tell you a little bit of vaccine 101. And this is just a simple slide of how vaccines work. And I hope most of you have an understanding. If not, you feel free to uh, put it in the QA. Feel free to contact me afterward if you have any questions. I can certainly explain to you a little bit more about how vaccines work. You can go to our website, historyofvaccines.org. Uh, a little plug in there for the History of Vaccines website. Historyofvaccines.org, we explain also how vaccines work. Um, so you take a weak or dead form of the germ, uh, a virus, a bacteria, a fungus, in some cases, uh, a parasite, and you, you inject it into the, uh, the body. You can inject it, you can take it by mouth, you can uh, take it up the nose like, as one of the newer flu vaccines does. And then the immune system uh, responds and develops antibodies that remember that germ and they remember it for a while. Some vaccines, not, not for too long and it's not so much to your immune system is because the virus mutates, the flu virus. Uh, some vaccines, they last, the, the immunity lasts years and years and years. Uh, the measles vaccine. Some vaccines, it's in between, uh, and it mostly has to do with the, the vaccine was so good at getting rid of the, the disease in the community that you're not exposed to the, the disease anymore, so you're not naturally boosted. Uh, when that happens, then we need those booster shots. That's why we get booster shots. Uh, it's what's happening with, um, with chickenpox. So it used to be a lot of children in the U.S. would get chickenpox. The vaccine comes around, gets rid of the chicken pox uh, for the most part. But those of us who had chicken pox when we were young are not being boosted anymore. Uh, our immunity is waning against it. And the chicken pox virus that is living inside of us can come back in a stressful situation or we have some other disease because it's dormant inside of us. It never really went away. And, and you know, it can come back and give us shingles. And so that's what the shingles vaccine is. It's just chicken pox uh, vaccine a little bit in a different dose for when you're an adult. So you get it, so you're re-exposed and, and, and re-boosted. So that's that's how that works. Um, and so you have this immunity for a while, hopefully for the rest of your life, hopefully against all the all the strains. Although, you know, sometimes you don't have it for, for the, the next strain, the next year in the case of influenza. So yeah, the, the thing about vaccines is that it's not just about you. A lot of people ask me, well, you know, if you're going to get the, the COVID-19 vaccine, are you going to be able to go back to uh, not wearing a mask or walking around in public without a mask or going to uh, a congregate setting? And the answer is no. Uh, it, it, it takes a while for the vaccine to work. Um, also, one dose is not enough. I need two doses. And also, the vaccine is not perfect. 
But the thing about the lack of perfection, the lack of 100% uh, efficacy, uh, is that when you get enough people in a, in a community, in a room, in a classroom, in a family, when enough people are immune uh, because they've been vaccinated or because they, they got the disease, but hopefully it's because they got vaccinated and don't have to live through the, the disease, then you have what is called herd immunity or community immunity. And so um, that when that happens, the virus or the bacteria has a, a, a less of a probability of jumping from one person to the other. Uh, it hits a wall basically of immune people that protect people who cannot not get vaccinated, who haven't been vaccinated, who haven't gotten the disease. Uh, it protects them. And that's what we, why we call it herd immunity is because you see this with animals when they get sick, if you get enough of a herd um, immune against the disease and the, those who are new to the herd will not get the disease. And that's kind of the concept. I like to call it community immunity. Some scientists still call it herd immunity. It's the same thing. It's just about, it's about protecting those who are not immune uh, by having enough people close to them and around them so that the, the pathogen, the germ doesn't get to, to them. So um, the first the first vaccine leap, the first leap in technology came with smallpox before smallpox. And I'm going to show you a picture of what smallpox looks like. This is a child who had smallpox. Um, smallpox is a virus. Uh, when you get it, you feel like you have uh, the worst flu ever and you have a high fever. And not only that, but a few days after your fever, you start getting these pox all over your body, all over your face, all over your hands, palms of your hands. You just get it everywhere inside your mouth, your throat. You can get pneumonia from it. You can get meningitis from it. Uh, about 30% of people who got smallpox at one point died. Uh, when we got better at diagnosing it and better at treating people, that, that number went down. But as you can imagine, in, in some of the developing nations, it was still a pretty high rate of death. And before the vaccine in 1795, uh, before that, it, it, the best way to prevent it was by not preventing it at all, but by giving you uh, smallpox in a controlled way. So the Chinese figured out that if somebody had smallpox, they could take the scabs from these, these pustules and dry them out in the sun and then make them into a powder and then sniff them. And if they sniffed it, they got a very mild form of smallpox because it wasn't enough of a dose to trigger a full on infection, right? And this, this continued to be used in, in China. And, and then the Persians started trading with China and it made its way to the Middle East. And then Europeans started trading with, with the Middle East and then made it its way into Europe. And then uh, the Africans also started trading with the Middle East and it made it way, its way into, into Africa. And so it was not, you were not avoiding smallpox at all. What you were doing is getting it in, in a controlled way. You were still infectious. You still could have gotten the full dose and gotten sick, uh, but the death rate was was much lower. Ben, Benjamin Franklin wrote about it in a, in a pamphlet um, showing the numbers be, of comparison of the people who got smallpox the natural way versus smallpox by inoculation. And it was clear, um, you know, less death. Uh, and then afterward, you came out on the other side being immune. But as you can imagine, you probably still had a lot of people to, who uh, became infected because you were carrying it while you were being treated with this inoculation. So smallpox, pretty bad. You ended up getting scarred, uh, scarred for life. There are, are plenty of stories of people, um, many women, uh, because beauty, you know, we, we assign it to, to women for the most part, uh, who were disfigured and they committed suicide because they were so disfigured. It was, it was a horrible, horrible disfigurement that happened. And as you can imagine, uh, when it happened, you either survived and were disfigured or, or you passed away. Um, some people got a former smallpox that didn't give them this disfigurement, uh, but they died because the, the smallpox was hemorrhagic smallpox. And it's kind of like Ebola where you just bleed out of every, every, uh, body organ and, and you didn't you didn't live long enough to get the the, the pox so um, this is inoculation on the left hand side here it's you still you still get pox throughout your arm uh, if you give it in the leg you get it throughout the leg um, sometimes you got it throughout your whole body but it wasn't as bad as getting it you know on the face and 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 in your throat uh, where you can inhale it and get pneumonia from it <clears throat> so Edward Jenner in 1795, uh, he was a physician. I went one slide too far. Let me go back one. Okay. So Edward Jenner is a physician in, in Great Britain. And he uh, he's walking around, <laughs> as physicians do, and he notices that milkmaids, uh, these women who milked cows, did not have that disfigurement on their face. They, they looked pretty much normal at the time when everybody got smallpox. And he started asking questions. And so a lot of them said, 
you know, I never got smallpox, but I did get it out of my hands. And he's like, what do you mean you got it on your hands? Said, yeah, I got it on my hands. Well, was that inoculation? No, I never, I never got inoculated by a doctor. Um, it just kind of happened. And, and so he said, well, ha have you touched anything that has anything that looks like what you have on your hands? And, and the women said, yeah, the cows get it. The cows get cowpox. And when we milk the cows, we get it on our hands. And so he, he noticed this over and over and over and over again. And so he kind of theorized that the cowpox virus, he, at the time they used the word virus, but they didn't know what a virus was. They thought that um, there was some infectious agent, but they just didn't know exactly what it was. Anyways, he thought um, this, this cowpox virus is probably giving you immunity uh, against smallpox. And so they uh, and so he designed an experiment. He went and found a young boy by the name of uh, uh, James Phipps and asked his parents, can I can I borrow James for an experiment? And so what he did, and that's the next slide that I'm going to show you, is that he took a, a cowpox pox, uh, uh, the, the fluid from Sarah Nelms, a milkmaid, and he inoculated James Phipps, just like they would do inoculation from smallpox. He just did it with cowpox. Um, Phipps falls ill with a mild case of cowpox. He got poxes here and there, but nothing, nothing too big. Not only that, but when he went home, he didn't give it to other people. Like he, he didn't give it to his siblings, which would have been the case had he had smallpox uh, or the smallpox inoculation. So um, then a few weeks later, after James was better from the cowpox, they, uh, Dr. Jenner took scabs from a, from a smallpox patient uh, and then tried to inoculate uh, James with the smallpox and nothing happened. Not only nothing happened, but James didn't have a, like a scar or anything from the smallpox. And in Jenner, the scientist that he was, he tried again and nothing happened. And then he tried his experiment on other people. The thing is, had he killed, had he killed James, um, it would have been game over for him. But, but no, he, he was correct in his theory that the cowpox was giving immunity to smallpox. And he wrote it up. He, he sent his treatise on uh, smallpox inoculation, cowpox inoculation to prevent uh, smallpox and later was called vaccination out of vaca, the, the Latin word for cow. Um, and it made its way around the world. And so um, Edward Jenner, he, he did that. So in 1795, 1797 or so, you know, the, when, when the vaccination is, is going around, um, this cartoon started making the rounds. And this, this cartoon is mocking Dr. Jenner uh, for giving the vaccine pock from a cow as that that little boy there supposed to be james is uh is holding it and you can see people with horrible disfigurements turning into cows having cows coming out of their mouths out of their eyes out of their nose uh this was an anti-vaccine editorial cartoon uh and uh, maybe you can see some similarities to what you see today from people who are anti-vaccine and I'll, I'll i'll talk a little bit about anti-vaccine versus vaccine hesitant there's a difference but you know you you see this you see this still today right um some some abnormal side effect to the vaccine is claimed uh and a little bit exaggerated and so here here you have you have this so uh, as I said, Jenner wrote it up, uh, sent it to to France, to some friends, friends in France, friends in France, and they translated it to different languages. One of those Spanish, and sent a copy of the Spanish translation of the the vaccine experiments to King Charles V. I think it was the fifth or the fourth, but King Charles. And so he, King Charles at the time had just recently lost some family members from smallpox and he wanted to do something about it. When he read this and his, his head scientist, um, uh, uh, Javier Balmes read the, read the accounts, uh, they said, look, let's just take this vaccine to all the corners of, of the Spanish empire. And they, they set out in 1803 from La Coruña, uh, Spain, to the new world, to the Americas, to the Spanish empire at the time to deliver the vaccine. They didn't have refrigerators. So how did they transport all that vaccine you ask? Well, they gave the cowpox uh, to a child, uh, an orphan, and they brought 13 or 14 other orphans with them. And when the, the pox, the cowpox developed on the, on the orphan, they would take some of it and give it to the next one. And then the next one, and then the next one, all the way until they got to Latin America, where they picked up more orphans and gave them the, the cowpox inoculation as they were taking them throughout the whole continent. And so 
they delivered the, the vaccine to tens of thousands of people. Uh, smallpox uh, epidemics were noted to have died down. They still happened, but not a lot of people would die. And, not, and the people who got the cowpox vaccine, very few of them caught, caught smallpox. It is believed that because of this method of not keeping it in the fridge or not having a fridge at all, right? Um, not everybody was getting the same dose of cowpox and having this, the, the same reaction. Nevertheless, the Catholic Church who came along on this plan um, Notice, noted this and send letters back to the Vatican saying this this thing works, man. This is this is actually this is actually great. Um, and so you, you can see it. it. It went everywhere. It went all the way to San Francisco, San Diego. And then they they jumped on their ships again and went over to the Philippines, went to uh, China, which was a, they had Portuguese ports there, uh, Macau. Uh, and then they went around the Indian Ocean, around the, the Horn of Africa uh, and then south. Uh, under under Africa to some British islands and then came back to Spain, went all the way around the world, just vaccinating everybody. If you ever go to the Philippines, there's a big statue of, of King Charles thanking him for bringing the vaccine because the Philippines were getting hit time after time because the report, uh, people would arrive on the, on the boats and and give smallpox to the whole island or islands and and, and it stopped when the, the vaccine came around. So this is Edward Jenner's uh, writings. Uh, he He... The difference between him and others who had theorized kind of the same same idea is that he was able to put it on paper and send it everywhere. He was an influencer in that in that sense, and so he got it everywhere. He really he really made this known the world over and explained it really well. Like this is what I did. This is what I saw. This is my experiment. These are my controls. You know, he not, he basically put it out on a, on a journal when journals were not heard of. There was more letters to like the Royal Academy of Sciences, etc. So. The first, the first leap. Uh, so that was one of the leaps, but this is this is the first leap. Uh, attenuated vaccines. So Louis Pasteur and the rabies vaccine. So in Europe, uh, rabies was very, very uh, uh, predominant. Uh, a lot of people would get bitten by dogs uh, and get rabies because those dogs would come into contact with wildlife who had rabies. Um, cities were, you know, right up next to forests and. A virus would jump from the animals to the humans. If that sounds familiar, it's because it happened last year in China. But this was this is in Europe with rabies, and people would get bitten, and they would get something that they would call hydrophobia, because when you get rabies, it, it swells your brain, it makes you delirious, it also attacks your, your nerves and your salivary glands. Um, you have a lot of saliva being produced. Uh, you're choking on it, basically. You don't want anything to do with water. Uh, that's why it's hydrophobia, or they say that animals that have rabies don't, don't like water. It's not that. It's just that the thought of drinking water makes them choke. And so it's deadly, 100% deadly. You get it, you're, you're dead. There's no treatment for it, even to this day. Um, only a couple of people have survived it, and that's after months and months and months of being in an induced coma and letting the brain, uh, giving the brain some time to heal. And it doesn't work for, for everybody. Uh, most everybody else dies. And so uh, still very, very deadly to this day. So uh, Dr. Uh, Pasteur had an idea. He said, well, if, if I give the full rabies virus to a rabbit, the rabbit will die. And then I'm going to take the rabbit's brain and I'm going to dry it out like the Chinese did, right? This is, he's, he's going back to those, those stories of, of inoculation because he theorized that in the drying process, something happened to the virus that made it less lethal. And again, this is a time when the microscope is just barely in its infancy. Nobody can see this virus. They just know that it does things and that it exists. And so he decides to take the brain of the first rabbit, dry it out, put it in a solution, give it to the second rabbit. The second rabbit gets rabies uh, and he does the same thing over and over and over and again after several generations, about 20 to 30 generations of doing this, the last rabbit doesn't get rabies. It stays perfectly healthy. Not only that, when he exposes the rabbit on purpose to rabies and not, nothing happens, the, the rabbit is inoculated against or vaccinated against uh, rabies. So, um, he, he goes and, and, and does this uh, experiment just like Jenner did where, and it wasn't an experiment, it was kind of an emergency situation, an emergency use authorization of the rabies vaccine, if you will, because a, a young boy by the name of Joseph Meister had gotten bitten by a dog and his mother pleaded with Pasteur that uh, she had read about him doing some experiments on rabies and, you know, did he have the cure? And he said, I don't have the cure. I have this, this, this method of making the virus less lethal. And in the end, it turns out to be a vaccine. He talks with some, some doctor's uh, friends and says, you know, can we give him the vaccine to, to Joseph and see what happens? Because, you know, um, 
it's better than nothing. He's going to die. He's going to get rabies. And so they said, okay, let's, let's do, do it as an emergency. So what they end up doing is they give Joseph the most attenuated version of the vaccine though, from the last rabbit. And then a few days later, they give him a, a stronger dose from one of the earlier rabbits and so on and so forth until they go in reverse until on the last day, after 28 days, they give Joseph, um, Oh, so this is 60. I'm just saying 60 rabbits, 60. Uh, on the last day, they give Joseph the full dose of the of the rabies virus, which he assumes that he already got from the ra- from the rabbit dog, and nothing happens. Uh, Joseph recovers from his from his wounds. Um, he goes on to be a, a worker at the Pasteur Institute in France. Uh, he doesn't die from this, and then Pasteur presents this and other studies at the. Uh, at the uh, French Academy of Science, and he receives a standing ovation. A, a reporter telegraphs back to the New York Times, a cure for hydrophobia. Dr. Pasteur announces the success of the inoculation treatment. Um, and so he, you know, he becomes famous for this. Joseph lives into all the way into 1940, uh, 1941. 19, yeah, because uh, he lived into the beginning of World War II when the Germans invaded Paris. Um, Joseph passed away uh, the day that, that the Germans arrived in Paris. And so um, he, he lived a, a long life from uh, 1885 to 19, the 1940s. And so this is a, a, a lithograph or an image of another person getting the, uh, the inoculation. Uh, Dr. Pasteur is observing up and to the left there, one of his uh, lab technicians or, or a fellow scientist. I, I don't know who this guy is, but he's giving it. And, and the thing about it is that um, the virus, the, the virus is alive, but it's attenuated. It, it doesn't, it doesn't give the disease, but what they want is for the virus to multiply itself in the body. And so they give it into the abdominal cavity where it's nice and warm and the immune system will take its time to get to it and it won't wipe it out right away like it would if you give it into the blood. Um, today, we give it into the muscle. It's much, much less painful than this. And I, and I say it personally because when I was six years old, I got bitten by a rabbit dog. Uh, I, was, I was living in Mexico at the time and a dog uh, was on the loose and I went to try to grab it and, and it bit me. They, my dad and my uncles uh, got a hold of the dog. It was taken to a, a pound and it died two days later from rabies. And I, 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 they started me on the, on the vaccines and they gave them to me in, in the belly button, uh, several doses over several days, just like they did with Joseph. Um, and I'm here today. So, uh, you know, it, it now it's now that you give the shot in the, in the arm, uh, and then you give the next shot in the other arm and then the next shot in the leg, like it, it's not as painful as giving it through the belly button or into the abdominal cavity, but it's, it's still effective. It's still, it's still the same theory of uh, a small dose and then a bigger dose and a bigger dose and a bigger dose uh, of the virus of the attenuated virus. So the immune system has a chance to build up against it. And then the real virus, which is circulating in you, if you got bitten by a dog or bitten by a bat or exposed to it by a bite from a raccoon, as is often the case here in the United States, um, the real virus gets wiped out by the immune response to the vaccine virus. So the next leap is the, the killed virus vaccine. And so you had, you had Jenner who was giving you a pox from a cow that was fully alive, fully capable of causing disease, although the disease was mild and nowhere near what smallpox did. And then you had an attenuated virus, which was what, what uh, uh, Pasteur did with, with rabies. And after Pasteur did that, they tried attenuation with other diseases like cholera, uh, like typhoid. And that's where you get those vaccines that are still alive, but they're, they're attenuated. They shouldn't give you the full on disease, but you'll still feel a little bit crappy, right? Because you're still getting, you're still getting uh, something that your immune system is going to fight hard against. And so the next leap is to actually kill the virus. Uh, and so that's the polio vaccine. So if you remember your history, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, uh, you know, pre- President Trump got COVID-19 and we wrote about it on the history of vaccines that he was not the first one to go up against the virus. And so here you have President uh, FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who had polio. He contracted polio late in his life, like in the, his 20s, uh, swimming, in a, swimming in a lake. Uh, polio at the time, uh, polio is transmitted from the fecal oral route. So you, you eat something with it, uh, you, you incubate it in your, in your intestines, you get sick, uh, a, a, a small percentage of people get paralytic polio, which is your nerves are attacked and destroyed and you, you get paralyzed. Um, and then the rest of the people, and actually all the people, they, they, it goes through their, their digestive system. And when sewer water gets into fresh water, 
you have epidemics. And so he, that's how he caught it when he was in his 20s. He still managed to uh, be a, a political powerhouse. He became president. Uh, he was elected over and over and over again before we had term limits uh, and, and helped defeat the, uh, the uh, Axis powers in the Second World War. So he, it started the, the March of Dimes because at the time in the United States and from the, the early part of the century to the 1950s, every summer there was an epidemic of polio. Kids would get it and enough of them would get it that would get paralyzed and they would have to end up on these, as you see on the right here, they would end up in these iron lungs where, um, because the nerves that allowed you to breathe got damaged and so you had to rely on this iron lung. This is before ventilators. And, and hundreds and hundreds, even thousands of children would, would come down and have to live in an iron lung. Uh, there are still a couple of people that are living in, in an iron lung that are left over from then. Most, most of the people have either passed away or they, they went on to live with ventilators, etc. Um, we have an iron lung at the College of Physicians of Philadelphia. If you ever, if you ever make your way to Philly, go go check it out. It's at the Modern Museum. They have it out there. You can see you, it's this ginormous machine, and and it's 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 working. Uh, they they found somebody who who was able to work on it. And a lot of people left them alive who know how to work it. Um, but this is what happened. You would have these these things happen. And so FDR started the March of Dimes, which was a fundraising society uh, of concerned parents and scientists who funded research into the vaccine. And so uh, you have these, these two scientists and you're gonna have to forgive me, it's late in the afternoon, <laughs> evening, and I forget the name of the two scientists here. Uh, I know that Jonas Salk is on the right just now and I forget the name of the, the doctor on the left and I am very embarrassed by that, but uh, we'll, we'll figure it out, we'll figure it out. Uh, let's do this. Isabel Morgan, yes, Isabel Morgan. Whew. All right, so Isabel Morgan, uh, she figured out that the virus didn't have to be alive for your immune system to attack it. She killed the virus in the lab using chemicals. And by now we can see viruses. Now we can grow them in the lab because now the, the electron microscope is, is alive and well. And she figured out that this could happen. People didn't believe that that could happen. Even Salk himself was like, no, 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 no. We need the living virus. We need the living polio virus. And she was like, no, no, look, I killed the virus in, in the lab and I gave it to monkeys and the monkeys mounted an immune response. And he said, well, but polio is transmitted by the fecal oral rod. How can you get an immune response when you inject it? And he, she's like, it, it works, man. Just, just go with it. <laughs> and he did. Uh, he did go with it. Uh, you might have heard of the Sabin vaccine. That's the, the drops, uh, oral drops uh, that is used in other parts of the world. Um, and that's, that's you know, attenuated. And this one was killed. And so in 1954, there was a, a community-wide, uh, a country-wide trial to get people vaccinated against uh, the polio uh, polio virus with dead polio, killed polio uh, vaccine. And so there, here you have these, these massive drives to get pol people vaccinated. You notice the, the person administering the vaccine is using a gun, uh, highly, highly not recommended nowadays because of cross-contamination. You don't know what the person before you had that might might be giving it to you. You, you end up with hepatitis, uh, but you don't have polio. Um, so there were these drives to get the vaccine everywhere. Everybody had to get vaccinated. People uh, write to us still today who remember being in the line with their parents for hours during the trials because some of them got a, a placebo and some of them got the actual vaccine. And this is how they do trials even to this day. You got two groups of people. One group gets the placebo and one group gets the actual vaccine. My wife participated in the uh, trial for the mRNA vaccine. She she got randomized into one or the other and she got the, the vaccine. Um, we believe she got the full dose because uh, she had uh, pain at the site and just felt a little, a little tired. Um, Felt, felt fine the next day. So maybe she got it. Maybe if she didn't, we'll find out when, when they, um, they unblind the study, but this, that was what they did. They, they randomized children into one group or the other. It was ethical at the time. Um, it probably would be still ethical today because it was killing a lot of children. So it was better than nothing, right? They were either going to get polio the natural way, or they were going to get it through the vaccine. So then well, why not go ahead and try it? And so they stopped the study early because they, they noticed that vaccinated children were not getting polio at all, while the unvaccinated children were getting it at the same rates that they would have gotten it had they, you know, the natural way. Um, and so they stopped the, they stopped the, 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 the trial right away. They told everybody who was in the placebo, uh, placebo group, 
you need to go get the vaccine. Your children is, needs to get the vaccine. The, the polio vaccine became widely available. By the 1970s, we didn't have these yearly epidemics anymore. Uh, people were not ending up on the, on the iron lungs anymore. By the 1980s, polio was eliminated from the United States. Um, by the 1990s, it was eliminated from the Americas. And then slowly but steadily, it was eliminated from other countries. And right now only Afghanistan has actual cases from the pol from natural polio. There are still some cases of polio derived from the oral vaccine because the oral vaccine is attenuated and it does multiply. And some people like with all vaccines, right? They're not 100% effective, not 100% safe. Some people will get the, the attenuated polio. The polio reverts back to being uh, just like it, it was before. Like it's not attenuated anymore and can give them polio. You still see that in some pockets in Africa of people who are getting that vaccine. Um, they they started in, in Latin America and in parts of the US as well. They would give the, um, in Latin America and Africa and developing nations, they started giving the oral polio. And then when the, the rate of polio dropped uh, significantly, they, they moved over to the, the injection. Uh, so that's the strategy even to this day. And now they're moving over to the injection in Africa so that you don't have these secondary cases of the polio vaccine. And only Afghanistan is left. That's it. You know, as soon as that is done in Afghanistan, you will have the second virus to be eradicated from humanity. The first one was smallpox in 1979. Uh, hopefully it'll be polio in, in, in a couple of years. It's, it shouldn't be taking too long. It'll be historic. It'll be just as historic as, as getting rid of this pandemic. Um, here you have the field trials uh, at the New York school children joined the national field trials and so here's a child getting the getting the vaccine. Uh, the science, some scientists are looking there on the right, uh, the woman there with the white hat I don't know why she's she looks outraged but. Uh, or maybe she's just surprised. Uh, maybe it's the way that the child has his color. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> but it was it was given throughout the whole the whole country, uh, different cities, different different places. This one is a picture uh, around the same time of the same trials. This is in Mississippi, and here you have a physician giving the the vaccine to a little girl who's also uh, dubious as to why she needs to be poked in the arm. <clears throat> Uh, and I have a comment from Ari, Arlene Handler, chickenpox vaccine and oral polio vaccine should not be given to children who will be with anyone on chemo or any person there because there are live vaccines. Uh, maybe Arlene, but you, the person on chemo needs to talk to a physician about that or the parents need to talk to a physician about that uh, because the measles, mumps and rubella is also a live vaccine. Uh, the diphtheria is also uh, a diphtheria. One of the diphtherias is also a live vaccines. And so you have to weigh the pros and cons um, whether you want the child to get chicken pox or polio or measles or mumps or rubella versus just keeping them away from the, the chemo patient. Uh, and you got to remember they, these vaccines, they're alive when they give them to you. They don't stay alive for very long after, after you get them. In fact, I'm glad you actually reminded me the study, the study that they use for measles, the measles vaccine, the measles virus is alive uh, when you get it. That's why there's no preservative. The, 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 the whole thing with autism and the, the measles vaccine has always befuddled me because they claim that thimerosal causes, causes measles causes autism, but there's no thimerosal in the, in the measles vaccine because it's alive, they would kill it. So anyways, um, so they, they took it, they took it to, uh, they took the vaccine to a, a, an institution for children and they gave the, the, the parents uh, a notice that, hey, we're gonna try this measles vaccine on your child. Um, and the parents said, yes, sure, go ahead. And they, they did. And day after day, the same physicians that gave the vaccine that would go and swab the children to try to recover the measles virus from their mouth and their, their throats, they never did, um, and the, vac the, the vaccine created antibodies, and the children, the children were fine afterward, and they never got measles, and, and they never were able to recover the the virus from anywhere. So uh, they do kind of the same studies now with chickenpox and 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 stuff, and it's not uh, not not recovered. Um, oral polio, it's only being given in, in developing nations. So you know, I, I hope that nobody in the U.S. is getting the oral polio vaccine. Uh, and and then again, like like I said, you have to weigh the pros and the cons, right? You have to weigh the child getting a, a dead, what it could be a potentially deadly disease versus just staying away from somebody on chemo, while the vaccine may be alive in their body, which is usually a few days. Then the, the immune system kicks in and, and kills it. Um, a question in the Q and A from Deborah: If you had polio vaccine from a sugar cube as a child, do you need a booster? No, no, you do not. Uh, you, you, you usually, you, you know, you got the sugar cube uh, and you hopefully haven't been to uh, Afghanistan up in the mountains. And so right now you're safe from polio. Um, you're, you should be good to go. No, you, you should not, you do not need a booster. Uh, you have any questions, you should talk to your physician uh, if you're going to, to Afghanistan. 
uh, up in the mountains. I don't know. So people still go, right? Uh, but no, uh, the answer is no. Okay. So, <clears throat> uh, okay. Let's keep going. Yes. So the vaccine was uh, the vaccine was a triumph. Stop. 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 Okay. So um, this is a, a nurse showing the the newspaper to a person on an iron lung. Vaccine triumph and polio threat. Um, I, I don't know if he's looking at that or if he's looking at the subline subheading plaster face identify slain woman skeleton. I find that a little bit interesting as well, uh, just as, as interesting as the vaccine triumph. Just a little humor there. So the next leap is fragments. You don't have to, you, so I, again, Jenner did the full of a, a virus that was fully inactivated. Uh, a pasture uh, attenuated it. It didn't kill it. It was still alive. Salk and, and Dr. Morgan, uh, they killed it and, and proved it and that it worked. Uh, and now you have fragments. <clears throat> Um, so this is the this is how they do the HPV vaccine. They take the DNA from the HPV virus, human papilloma, papilloma virus, um, and HPV is a sexually transmitted infection. Uh, about ninety percent of the human of human beings will get it at one point in their lives because we're human, um, and 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 be exposed to to it. There is a, a strain uh, of HPV that causes general warts, and that's a strain that doesn't doesn't. Uh, but there's there's strains within those strains that can give women, if they get it, they can get uh, uh, cervical uh, abnormalities in their cells and they have to go and get tested again. And it's, it's painful and it's a hassle. Um, and a few of them will develop cervical cancer. It's, uh, so HPV is a main cause of cervical cancer the world over. So what scientists discovered was that they could take the DNA from the HPV virus they could find the region in the DNA that coded for uh, uh, a molecule that our immune system would detect and react to and create antibodies against. And they put that DNA into yeast and the yeast would read that DNA and create this molecule. And the molecule tended to cluster into groups of fives called pentins. And then together they would just all cluster together into a virus-like particle. Um, it's not the virus. It's not, it's not alive. It won't infect. It won't cause anything. It doesn't have any DNA. It's just little proteins put together, created by yeast, um, you know, and, and, and very highly effective, uh, super highly effective. In places like Australia, they are forecasting the end of cervical cancer there uh, in a few years, just because um, of the wide acceptance of the vaccine. The U.S., a little controversial, right, because there's certain things trains of thought about HPV. Um, certain people think that uh, that women should not be protected against uh, uh, cervical cancer because of, uh, you know, morality, uh, things about morality. We will leave it at that. We won't get too controversial in this in this session. Just you go, I will go off and read about the controversies with the HPV vaccine. Um, certain people think that the HPV vaccine will cause some change in your DNA. It doesn't because, it, it, surprise, it doesn't have any DNA. Uh, so, you know, it, this is a very safe way of doing this because it's not, not alive, not attenuated, not killed. It's not even the virus. This is just a little protein's put together from, from yeast. Uh, the yeast did all the work. The yeast are the heroes here. They put together the, the vaccine. And so then the next, um, yeah, this is the Gardasil vaccine. And again, there's different brand names. I just put Gardasil because it's the one, it's like kind of like saying Kleenex, you know, it's facial tissue paper, but we go with Kleenex because that's the most widely known. Same thing with Gardasil, there's different ones. And again, I have no conflict of interest. You know, my my only interest in Gardasil is that my daughter will get it when she's uh, of age, and so she'll be protected from cervical cancer. Uh, my wife got the vaccine in her time, um, and and boys are now recommended to get the vaccine as well. So, uh, very uh, very high level of, of uh, effectiveness uh, that cervical cancer will be a thing of the past, just like smallpox and hopefully polio soon. So the fourth leap is genetics. And we talked, we touched a little bit on genetics here with the Gardasil vaccine and the HPV vaccine, but genetics um, is, is last, it's, we think it's last week's news uh, with the new vaccines, but it's actually for the last 20, 25 years, 
that genetics had really come come along. So this is one of the first examples of when, when genetics were brought into the, the equation of vaccines. Here you have a, a flu virus, they take the genes and they take the genes that cause the most reaction for our immune system and they put them into, into a, another strain of flu that probably will not make you as sick as, as the first one. And so when you when you get when you get this this new flu strain with these genes from the other one, your immune system will create create immunity not only against this second second flu strain but against the flu, first one as well, and and you just you know you just can do that. And but the thing to take away from here is that scientists are now able to find the DNA or RNA in, in the case of, of flu, they find the specific protein code uh, and snip it and put it into something else. Um, in this case, they put it into another virus. In the case of the mRNA vaccine for COVID, they put it into a little lipid, little fat globule, microscopic, not, not this big, microscopic. And, uh, and um, they, that's, that's what you get. And so this is where this is, where this is heading. It's, it's heading into using DNA to, to create the immunity. You're not even using the fragment anymore. It's all genetics. It's, it's now advanced. This is how the, the mRNA vaccine works. At the center here, uh, let me see if I can get the pointer. Uh, laser pointer. Yes, at the center here, and I hope you can see the laser pointer, uh, is the, the mRNA inside this lipid nanoparticle, lipid being fat, and they just put it, wrap it up in fat basically. And your cell, this is this pink blob here is a cell, it takes it in the mRNA then goes to a, a little thing in the cell. This is not even in the nucleus. This is not even in the DNA. It never gets to the nucleus, never gets to the DNA. Uh, it goes to the ribosome. The ribosome creates a viral antigen. In this case, the, 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 the spike protein that looks just like the virus. Um, and it gets transferred to your immune uh, centers of the cell. The cell then presents those particles to other cells on the left hand, this is a CD8 T cell, cytotoxic, comes around, looks at it, and now from now on, after looking at it, anything that resembles it, any cell having this viral particle inside of it will be killed, uh, will be marked for destruction. Uh, that, that's what the T cells, the CD8 T cells do. Cytotoxic, they kill cells. Cyto meaning cell, toxic meaning toxic, uh, they kill those cells. On the right hand side, right hand side a CD4 T cell, a T helper cell, will come along and, and see that and pick it up and take it to the B cells who that will then create antibodies. And from now on, the, the B cells will create antibodies and those antibodies will, will attach to any cell that has this viral particle, right? Nowhere along the way did you, actually get, did you actually get the virus. What ended up happening is that the ribosome read the code and created the protein uh, here for the antigen. And so then your immune system just presents that protein. And next time you see the protein, if it's the actual virus from an actual infection, attack it with everything you got, uh, kill it with the cells or kill it with the antibodies inactivated. Don't let it go into other cells. This is highly, highly advanced technology, but it was created about two decades ago when they were looking for cancer vaccines. So what they would do is that they would take the DNA from, or RNA from the cancer and use the same technique to try to get the immune system to attack uh, cancer cells. Not very successful because cancer cells are big cells. They're not tiny little viruses. They're very robust. They have their own defense systems, their own mechanisms to repair themselves should they get attacked. And so um, not as effective as what has been seen now with the mRNA vaccine. Okay. <clears throat> So the next leap, more genetics. So it only gets better from here. So um, our genes determine our fingerprints and each fingerprint is unique. We are each unique. We share about a thousandth of, of DNA with each other. Like we're not that, that close to each other genetically. Uh, we have different genes. And so that leads to people reacting differently to medicines, reacting differently to vaccines. You know, some people might have the allergic reaction, might, some people will not. Some people might have a high fever. Some people might have a severe reaction. Uh, and unfortunately, yes, there will be people that get a vaccine and they, they, they die. It will be in a rate much, much lower than if they actually got the actual disease. But nevertheless, it happens. It's, 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 again, vaccines are not 100%, not 100% safe, not 100% effective, but that's just because of how our immune systems work. 
That's that's the story there. Now, if there was a way to say to say yes, you know, we're gonna study your genes at one point in your life, and or right before you get the vaccine. And those genes will tell us your risk of acquiring a disease. Right now with coronavirus, you notice children don't get it as often. Some children do, and some children have passed away from it. But for the grand majority of children and some young adults, they don't get it. They just don't, they don't get infected with it. The virus lands on them, they breathe it in, they, they have it inside of them, but it doesn't give them disease and it doesn't multiply and it has nowhere to go. Pretty, pretty strong evidence that it's a genetic component in that uh, either they, they don't have the gene for the virus to attach to the cells or they, they don't have the gene um, for an immune reaction that would, that would, or they have a gene, I'm sorry, they do have a gene for an immune reaction that gets rid of it right away. So yet to be determined. But anyways, a gene, the genes can tell you if you're at risk of acquiring a disease. Um, it, asks, it tells you if you're at risk of being injured or dying from that disease. Um, it, the genes can also tell you if you will react to the vaccine. Like I said, there are very few instances. It happened in 1976 with Guillain-Barre syndrome with the flu vaccine. It happened. It happens at times with, with people who get some of the even more modern vaccines. They get an allergic reaction and sometimes it may be life-threatening. Um, so the genes can tell you if you're going to react to that vaccine. And so the question is, can we tailor vaccines to your immune system? So right now, there are certain certain drug tests, um, certain genetic tests that you can take, kind of like 23andMe, but a little more advanced, uh, that the doctor can order, and it'll tell the physician if you're going to react in one way or another to a drug. So you have a gene. Uh, so for example, you you have a gene that doesn't doesn't allow you to process alcohol very good. You probably should stay away from alcohol because you'll get you'll get drunker quicker. Um, you have a gene that doesn't allow you to process a medication fast, and so you have to get a lower dose because too much of the medication might build up inside your body and and hurt you. But what if we can actually get a, a gene profile of the person who will react uh, badly to the vaccine and just say no, you have the gene. Uh, or genes. Uh, let's keep you safe from the disease and uh, keep you away from, from con contracting it, but give the vaccine to everybody around you so they'll protect you. Um, or you're going to have a reaction. Let's give you, you're going to have an allergic reaction. Let's give you uh, a shot of epinephrine beforehand or have the Benadryl ready, or you can ask for the next three days off of work because you're going to feel crappy from getting it. You know, we'll be able to do that. And that's, that's coming because there's already all this information on what each gene, the human genome project from the 1990s, mapped out the human genome. Each genome from every person is different. So it's just a matter of finding those differences and finding those codes and being able to tailor the vaccines to that. It's coming uh, in, in my lifetime, certainly. I think it's going to happen. Uh, it, it's going to be a, a, a test that I go get at the doctor uh, and they, they'll be able to tell me, yeah, you know what? You're at very high risk of contracting the flu. Um, and we have tailored this vaccine to you, to your genetic profile. So you won't, A, you won't get the flu uh, because it, your immune system will react really well to the vaccine. Um, and, and, and B, you know, it's, it's going to be very safe for you. You won't have an allergic reaction. You won't even feel sick, that kind of thing. So hopefully that happens in my lifetime. Uh, I think it will. Uh, that's, that's where we're heading with vaccines. And I'll be happy to document it and put it on the history of vaccines, historyofvaccines.org. <laughs> okay. So with that, uh, I thank you very, very much for your time. I, we have, if you have questions or comments, you have the QA section, you have the chat. I'm more than, than willing to, uh, to entertain your questions there. I know that this was a very broad overview of what's going on. You know, I could give you an entire lecture on mRNA vaccines. I can give you an entire lecture on vaccines in general. Um, I can talk about some of the controversies that have happened with vaccination. The Cutter incident where the, the killed polio virus wasn't as killed as they thought it did and it ended up giving a lot of people polio. Uh, the 1976 flu vaccine, which caused excess number of Guillain-Barre, um, it, is, it is believed. Uh, the DPT vaccine in the 1980s that caused high fevers and it was causing a lot of, a lot of kids to have very high fevers and those high fevers were, uh, were harm, harmful, but now there's a different component to it to solve that issue. Uh, we can talk about those things, uh, not right now, right? But uh, I, I wish we, we had more time. So uh, Arlene, thank you. Yes, thank you. And thank you for, for that, Arlene. And again, uh, these are questions that people need to have with their, with their healthcare providers. You know, we know somebody who's on chemo, somebody in our household is on chemo. Uh, can we hold off on this vaccine until that, that goes off? What is the risk of the child of not getting the vaccine? Those are the kind of questions that you should really have with your healthcare provider. 
Uh, <clears throat> Diane, what do you anticipate with uh, will happen with the mRNA COVID vaccine for blood cancer patients whose B and T cells are defective? Will will we not be inoculated, or will we just not make antibodies? Uh, well, you probably if you have some sort of issue with the B and T cells, then you will not make antibodies, and uh, so inoculation that will not just not do anything, right? The mRNA still goes in, it still gets processed, turned into proteins, the proteins are presented, but if the T cells are not there to tag it and say from here on out, everything with it is gonna get killed, then nothing will happen. Um, I don't know what the public health recommendation is for this. Certainly they, they, there's a, the FDA, if you, if, if you have the time, uh, the FDA discussions on safety, the safety profile of the mRNA vaccine, a lot of these questions came up of what about people who have this and what about people who have that? It was very interesting to see scientists quizzing other scientists um, you know, uh, on, on all these things. Uh, did you think about this? Did you think about that? Did you consider this? It was a really good question by uh, Paul Offit, who developed the rotavirus vaccine, who is often thought of somebody who pushes vaccines. Uh, he said, well, you say that 95, it's 95% effective, but are you sure you're, you're just not saying that because people stayed away from, from people with COVID because uh, they tend to know more about it. And so they, they tend to get vaccinated and be volunteers because they want, you know, they're involved. It's called the volunteer bias effect. Uh, that was a really good question by him, uh, really threw a wrench into a lot of, you saw their, their, their heads spinning. And they said, well, they, we've had something like 72,000 people participating. What are the odds that all of them are being cautious about COVID or can actually stay away with so many of them, like my wife being healthcare providers? Uh, and there's a good chance that they're not really, you know, staying away from the virus. So that's, uh, I highly encourage you, if you're really concerned about the mRNA vaccine safety, go watch those, those videos. I know they're super long and might get very scientific, but uh, they're very interesting. Very interesting to see how they really do. Uh, they really did a good job, in my opinion, of quizzing the, the developers of the vaccine. So yeah, Dan, I don't know. Uh, I don't know what the recommendation will be. I'm sure it's going to be coming down and with more and more people getting it, they're just going to, out of chance, they're going to find people with these uh, B cells and T cells that are defective and, and diagnosed uh, that way. And they're going to see what, what happens when they, they get inoculated. All right. Any other questions, comments, concerns, constructive criticism? <clears throat> it's almost, oh, it's actually 8.30 here. So I, I, I don't mean to keep you. Uh, again, your time is very valuable. And I thank you very much for, for coming to this. Will the adenovirus vaccines not have that problem? Uh, that is a good, that is a good question. So there's another vaccine for just for those of you who don't know, there's another vaccine for COVID-19 where they, they take the, they take the MRNA or they take the, the genetic or the protein from the, the coronavirus and they put it in an adenovirus, which is a different type of virus that has been inactivated. It won't, won't do anything. It's killed. Uh, but they put it in the shell, they kind of stuff it in there and give you that. And the adenovirus will then be recognized as a virus by your immune system, swallowed up, and the process will begin. Instead of wrapping it in lipid, they're wrapping it in this adenovirus. So who knows, right? The, the trials for that are still ongoing. That's the Oxford vaccine. Um, the safety profile has been has been good so far. They ran into they ran into some issues because they were they were Confab not confabulating, that means making up. No, they were um, uh, combining two studies together and, and showing those results instead of one at a time. And they they since corrected that. And when you see the study side by side, it's 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 kind of a, a goodish safety profile, uh, probably not as effective as the, the mRNA vaccines still to be determined. Um, you know, don't 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 hold me to that. Uh, you know, something is better than nothing. So we'll see how that goes uh, with the uh, uh, adenovirus. Um, uh, thank you for, for being here for this eye-opening presentation. Uh, yeah, you know, history, history. We need to know history. It informs us for what we see today. It puts what we see today into context. Um, when, when people say it's too fast, I kind of just chuckle and we're like, no, we're building up on 200 years of, of vaccine technology. It's not too fast. In the 1920s, you, it used to take a week to make a car and now they can, now I can order it today and I'll probably have it next week right off of the factory. So it's, it's just technology advances. Uh, do you think that we will have to get vaccinations for COVID yearly, just like the flu vaccine? The, the, 
the jury is out on that, but I do know that the, the COVID virus does not mutate as fast as the, the flu vaccine, the flu virus. The flu virus does mutate year after year, year after year, sometimes a, a few times out every year. The HIV virus mutates dozens of times uh, a year, even mutates within your own body. And that's why we haven't been able to get a vaccine for it because it just, it will just mutate and make, you know, the vaccine will be useless. So, uh, so it's slower than the flu. It's way slower than HIV. Uh, it still does mutate. So I think the jury is out on that. However, do remember that this is not the only coronavirus that causes human disease. There are four other coronaviruses. And if you have a toddler like I do, uh, you get head colds almost every six weeks because they, they take it to school and share among each other. And there's four coronaviruses that uh, do give us those head colds. So we might have immunity already against, uh, against COVID and just not know it from, from being exposed to those other ones. Um, and so when the vaccine comes along, it'll give us immunity against the fifth one. Uh, better, better immunity might last a little bit longer. We might get, be getting just, just getting boosted. We'll see. We'll see. And the, the other ones are the SARS uh, virus that came out in 2003. And then the other one is the MERS coronavirus from 2011. So there's uh, a total of seven coronaviruses now that cause human disease. Are there other viruses that have been identified that risk escalating to pandemic levels in the coming years? Influenza, influenza, uh, influenza, <laughs> Uh, we had a pandemic in 2009, but we were lucky because number one, we had the readily available laboratory test for it, not so with coronavirus. Um, I know that a lot of people want to blame the current administration for not being prepared in, in, when it comes to labs. It, it, there was just no way of getting a lab test done in, in any kind of record time. This was a new virus. They had to see it in the lab. They had to they had to grow it. They had to get the test going so that, you know, my, while there have been other public health failures with the current administration and the way that it handled the, the pandemic, that was not one of them. The, the, that could not have been helped. In 2009, we had already uh, tests that would identify flu viruses, including the novel flu virus. And then uh, all we had to do was replace the, the inside of the, the flu virus, uh, flu vaccine that existed with the, the H1N1. And we had a vaccine in, in, in November, in September. So that wasn't even coming up with a whole new vaccine. It was just changing the, the filling like we do with pies, apple pie to cherry pie. Uh, so we got super lucky. And the H1N1 virus did not kill as many people as as, it, as the H3N2s do. The H5N1 kills everybody, but that doesn't transmit readily from person to person. So if there's going to be another pandemic, it's going to be probably the influenza uh, virus. Uh, we have a pandemic that's been going on for 42 years, which is the HIV virus. Um, you know, and so probably influenza, probably another coronavirus, just the way that cities are moving into four forests uh, might cause another pandemic. Ebola, uh, while not necessarily pandemic potential, you saw how disruptive it was. There's going to be another epidemic of Ebola in Africa sooner rather than later, and it's also going to be disruptive just like that other one was. Uh, do you expect vaccine development to be as quick as this one for future news? He says, yes. No, this was not a one-time accomplishment. This is a leap. You know, after we've taken this leap, we're not going back. We're going to get, we're going to get even better. Like I said, you know, there, there's going to be another leap soon. That just seems to be accelerating. So it took thousands of years to get to the, 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 the generous vaccine. It took, you know, de decades to get to Pasteur, a few more, a few less decades to get to polio, and then less than half a century to get to the, the HPV vaccine with just the fragments, and then a decade to get to the mRNA. And now we're here, like it's, it's getting faster and faster, just like with computers too. You know, you see, you see them getting faster and better. So technology is advancing and, and knowledge is advancing. We're sharing knowledge now like we, we don't before, right? You all are here. Uh, you know, back in the 1980s, when could something like this have ever happened? You could only get a lecture at, the, at a university or, or college, right? You, you wouldn't be able to just readily access, access it. Or you would have to pay a lot of money to get the video, you know, or sit at, on a PBS uh, TV station to listen to it. Now you can, it's on demand. Um, uh, to, to do what type of vaccines are Johnson and Johnson and some of the others? They're more of the traditional ones. They're just, they're attenuating the coronavirus uh, or they're killing the coronavirus. They're more very traditional, just, uh, just like the other ones, um, the ones before them. So that's, that's, that's how they're, they're, they're going the traditional route. Um, and that's probably why it's taking, taking a little bit longer. When this began, I asked a couple of my colleagues, uh, it, it was going to be hard to get a vaccine because the coronavirus doesn't grow well in the lab and it doesn't. And so that's the advantage of the mRNA vaccine. You don't need to grow it. You don't need to have it. Your laboratory people don't need to get exposed to it. Um, you're just working with the code uh, that, that, that you, you read the first virus and you read the code and you're off to the races. So uh, the other ones are more traditional. They have to grow the, the, the virus in a lab. The lab has to be super secure because there's, there's a vaccine now, but you know, uh, and so they, they need to be super secure and it takes, it takes time. It takes a lot of money. Uh, 
Do you expect worldwide cooperation on these new diseases as, as happened this time? I sure hope so. Uh, you know, the World Health Organization, they, they do collaborate. And even when you hear, again, you hear, we get political many times and I, I wish that we didn't. And it doesn't matter what political political leanings uh, you have. Um, even with the, the distrust or, you know, thinking on the World Health Organization, we still collaborate it. We still, we still communicate and everybody's colleagues with each other. A lot of us went to school together. You know, we have each other emails and cell phones. There's collaboration happening either through formal or informal means. So yeah, no, it'll still be happening, you know, and I hope we, we as a society get to a point where we separate the politics or political leanings from the public health side of things and things that need to get done to keep us all safe. You know, it, it'll happen. We'll get there. It's just, it's just a hiccup. It's just, you know, one of those, one of those accidents of history that we're, we're here. It's not the first time. There were people who were anti-mask in 1918 during that pandemic. There have always been people who are vaccine hesitant because they don't quite know what goes into a vaccine. They have their doubts about it. They've heard stories or they've seen stories. There's people who are anti-vaccine who just really don't want anything to do vaccines and they go back all the way to, to Jenner. So it, it's it's just a, one of those things. Um, microchips. No, no, there won't be microchips. Uh, so, <laughs> so if you want to, if you want, if you want to fall for the microchip thing, do me a favor, get your, get your very powerful cell phone, very powerful, right? You can, you can call, you can get all the things, wrap it in aluminum, aluminum foil. No, don't even wrap it in aluminum foil. Put it in a, in a Ziploc, that's, you know, at your own, at your own risk, put it in a Ziploc bag and put it in a, in, in your bathtub at the bottom of the bathtub and fill the bathtub with water. It won't get a signal. Uh, it's not that powerful. It doesn't get through water. Uh, and we're made out of a lot of, a lot of water. So chips, uh, there's no information that is going to get outside of us. It's not, they would, they would, we would, we would feel them. They would heat up from the energy required to get that information. So if you're worried about chips and vaccines, go read up on physics, uh, uh, radio waves and stuff like that. And it's not, it's not a thing. Um, uh, mo water molecules are very uh, opaque to radio and we're made out of a, a lot of water molecules some of us more than others uh so no 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 chips there uh okay any other questions and that's the thing right i, I just it just reminds me like that's why we have science fairs and i wish we had more science fairs because it's questions like that they may sound silly, but people do take it seriously. And I'm sure your, your question was well intended about the chips. And I, you know, that is a concern. And we, we as public health practitioners, we have to address these concerns. Um, but a simple experiment that could be done at a science fair will dissolve that theory, right? Because if the cell phone that is very powerful, you put it in, in a Ziploc bag and you put it in water, doesn't have a signal. When I go swimming with my watch and it, as soon as I get under the water, it doesn't have a signal uh, anymore. Uh, then, then a chip inside of you, and all that water inside of you, and the, the cells and everything, the 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 signal strength should have to be tremendous for any communication there, and that would cause heat, and that would cause burns, and so uh, that's why it doesn't work. Okay, Jill, do you have any other questions? Nothing. Comments? else from me, I don't see any more coming in. Um, I just want to say thank you uh, to you for presenting. We really appreciate you joining us this evening. Thank you to everyone for attending the presentation. I did put a link in the chat to everyone with our program survey, uh, just to help us improve our future programming and make sure that uh, our programming is having positive impacts on the community. We do try to get feedback after each program. So if you have a moment, if you can click on that survey link, we'd appreciate your, uh, your feedback and information on this. Um, if mm -hmm. you have additional questions, please feel free to stick around, ask them in the chat, ask them in the Q&A. Um, if you'd like to, we've got a little bit more time for other questions. And uh, if not, we will uh, thank you and hope everyone stays healthy. Yeah, safe yeah, this please. Holiday season. Yeah, if you have any, uh, and my, I'm sorry, my light died. Uh, if you have any questions about the vaccine, you have any concerns, my number one advice is go talk to your health, a health care provider, it doesn't have to be your health provider. I know that access to healthcare is, is, a, is a big issue here in the U.S. Um, you know, the pharmacist at the pharmacy, um, a nurse at a clinic, they, they, they're going to give you better information than, than random people on the internet, random doctors of public health giving lectures. Uh, and, and, and they'll ask you additional questions to, to get to the bottom of what you're asking. Like I said, you know, if, if somebody who knows your, your health uh, history 
would be better to to ask questions about side effects, about possible uh, you know exposure to other people, people on chemotherapy, etc. Um, what we do in public health is we give public health recommendations and and then allow give people the most information possible so they make the best decision. And and a lot of those recommendations include go talk to your health provider. And a lot of people get frustrated with me when I say that because they want an answer out of me. Um, but talk to the health provider. And they're going to know your history or you can talk to them about your medical history and they'll give you that information. For example, there's a lot of uh, people who are getting this new vaccine and they're having allergic reactions. And so people are now worried and rightfully so if they're going to have an, a reaction. Um, the, re the level of the rate of the reactions, the number of people divided by the total number of people who get the vaccine is so small that it would be like me panicking over getting on an airplane every single time I get on an airplane because planes have crashed. It's just something that happens very rarely. Um, but I, as a human being, right, we, I, there's still people that have fears of flying and I, I, I have a little bit of that. And so uh, I rationalize it in my head. I'm like, well, it's, the chances of it happening are actually very, very low. Uh, and, and it's not that there's nothing to worry about. It's just that the thing that there is to worry about is so rare that, um, you know, it's, it, it's, if it's going to happen, it's, it's going to be, uh, it's going to be a rarity. Uh, and so for those kind of things, I go to a healthcare provider and I ask them, look, i never had a reaction in my life to a vaccine. What are the chances of me getting a reaction? I don't have any other allergies. What are the chances? I have a bee allergy. What are the chances? Things like that. And the healthcare provider would be the best one to put all that together and, and give you a, a precise answer. <clears throat> anything in the chat let me see thank you thank you thank you thank you for your time thank you all right with that right. i think we will end our presentation so thank okay. you again everyone thanks for thank coming you. thank you to dr nahara we yeah. appreciate your time and thank you for the invitation this has been great. Thanks. All right. Thank Take you, everyone. Take care, everyone. Good Have night. a good night.